we were saying that from Laroel's point of view on the anthropological difference that corresponds to the two and a half thousand years of Greco philosophical history, we can say, or he can say, that uh, Michel Foucault's philosophy is essentially backward looking. It's uh, still in the cavern of anthro anthropological thought and it's the last stages where anthropological parallelism, parallelism has become anthropological difference and then uh, man as a figure is dissolved or deconstructed um, into a uh, uh, mass of uh, elementary particles or sand um, by the human sciences. So that raises the question, uh, are all Larouel's contemporaries seen through his eyes uh, similarly backward looking? He could argue that a large part of Deleuze, maybe he thinks all of Deleuze, because he uh, seems to reduce uh, Deleuze to the philosophy of difference. And later on, he says that um, becoming is just difference too. And, and so uh, he takes in the later Deleuze and Guat Guattari works as well. But um, one could argue that a large part of Deleuze's work uh, fits into this uh, backward looking perspective of the anthropological difference, but that some aspects already within, let's say, logic of sense and within uh, what is philosophy are forward looking, at least to the degree that they're promising uh, sketches and, and programs of uh, an investigation of to come of the, the new continent that Laruel is, is um, indicating and um, uh, laying claim to or um, exploring as a transcendental uh, explorer. Uh, one could also argue that Badiou up to, well, we're in 1985 in this book, so perhaps Badiou up to that moment is still within the anthropological difference, that being an event may already represent uh, break with that uh, anthropological cavern uh, by the double notion of multiplicities freed from the philosophy of difference. That's one of the accomplishments of uh, being an event. And by the notion of uh, truths that are freed from the um, empirical transcendent polarity that uh, usually uh, binds the notion of, of truth. So uh, it's a little uh, open from that point of view, although we'll see that um, Laruel tries to close up these uh, potential alternatives as uh, gaps he's trying he will try to fill in the gap uh, in his uh, later works he continues in this way anthropological difference is the positing and the forgetting of the real or finite essence of man so we're getting a, a genealogy here that we'll see developed a, a, a little bit in the, the next paragraph. We've got 
the Greeks before philosophy, the Homeric Greeks, that is um, the mythological uh, world, if you want. It's not in the capital W world of philosophy, and so um, he's not going into that um, either in this book or I don't know if he ever develops an idea of the Homeric Greeks. We have to look at other people um, for a pluralist view of the Homeric Greeks. Uh, uh, we have to look at um, uh, All Things Shining by uh, Hubert Dreyfus and Sean Kelly. We have to look at the account of the uh, Greeks in um, Paul Feyerabend's uh, later chapters in uh, Against Method and in his Philosophy of Nature. Or I'm not sure where else there are uh, books working within the same pluralist uh, dispersive tradition that uh, Larouel is setting up and laying claim to that um, deal with this uh, blind spot in uh, Larouel's genealogy. But the genealogy is, is the mythological times, the Homeric Greeks and the Egyptians and going back, uh, that's all a, a sort of cloud for him. After that, we get um, the creation of a Greco um, philosophical thought, and it has two uh, variants that um, come or seem to come in uh, chronological order. There's um, a long period of we have the separation of uh, Logos and Anthropos and everything we theorize is a mixture of the two but um, regimenting the mixture there is first anthropological parallelism where uh, uh, Anthropos um, is parallel to Logos, usually um, the determining term, and then we don't know. Uh, we don't know when, uh, um, because um, he's written on philosophy of difference. We could say the anthropological difference comes up with um, uh, Nietzsche, but that seems and on from there and progressively. Um, uh, undermines and dissolves the notion of um, man till it comes to the death of man but because there's this Althusserian, Althusserian strain in uh, Larouel we could say that the anthropological difference uh, comes in when um, uh, physical science as we know it Galilean science comes in with uh, Galileo and that's already driving um, a sharp wedge between the the logos, which uh, is transformed into science, and the anthropos, which is left to um, uh, ideology, folk psychology, folk physics, um, folk uh, everything, uh, uh, all and everything. So. Um, Mythic times, anthropological parallelism, anthropological difference, and now maybe with Larouel and two or three others, if he's in a good mood, um, partially with sketches and, and programs, uh, with Larouel, um, something else is is possible. A new paradigm is possible. That, that is his science of man. So we can continue this line of thought of Larouel's um, anthropological difference then is identical to its own history and auto destruction or auto inhibition of the mixture of man and logos. So um, that's programmatically, well, that's programmed from the beginning. 
It may go through a, a, an anthropological parallelism, uh, parallelism uh, phase. There may be one way of describing ontotheology, um, but it's programmed to uh, come to its own auto-destruction and uh, auto-inhibition. So, this anthropological difference is more profound than the humanism attacked by uh, contemporary philosophy. So even when contemporary philosophy is uh, anti-humanist, so in structuralism, in um, Althusser, in uh, Foucault, um, they're still not getting at the real phenomenon. They're still um, uh, surface critiques because even deeper is what they haven't isolated out but that Laruel has isolated the anthropological difference. This anthropological difference reigns even in unitary deconstructions of humanism. So if we're taking a, a, a loose definition of deconstruction, we could say that uh, Foucault and Derrida are part of the, main, uh, the same phenomenon of unitary deconstruction of humanism. So uh, we know unitary is part of the um, part of the cavern. It's part of the world uh, of authorities and relative minorities. But it seems to open up as an adjective unitary deconstructions that another sort of deconstruction uh, could be possible and that uh, Laruel, Laruel could adopt. If he used the terms of this book, he would be obliged to call it unary uh, deconstruction. So the one that is directly uh, minorities or multiplicities um, uh, would be by its very exclusion of these anthropological terms would be uh, capable of unary deconstruction. Laruel later in um, uh, non-standard philosophy takes up the term deconstruction and says that one could view his enterprise as quantum deconstruction. So uh, possible salvage of the term deconstruction uh, is allowed for here. From now on, it, that is to say anthropological difference, is at issue as difference and not as it speaks of man. So there was always the illusion, because we were speaking about uh, man, that um, there could be some direct way to get to uh, Laruel's science of man. We're talking about man, but um, uh, within the Greek uh, philosophical thought. So a way not taken would have been to take directly there and then, when man was a focus, um, the concept of man and apply the operations of radicalization, intensification, transvaluation and transcendentalization and maybe we could have um, uh, short-circuited the uh, last phase which is that of anthropological difference but this way uh, was not um, taken and uh, so we came to a period where uh, we no longer even speak of man, except as, oh yeah, that ideological concept. Anthropology as parallelism, parallelism or as difference is the Greco unitary myth that must be excluded by a theoretically justified science of man. So this um, anthropo, um, logical difference or anthropology is um, 
to be excluded because it's a um, it's a disjunction of that which must be conjoined. Remember from the um, uh, forward we talked about uh, disjoining those who disjoin uh, rigor and the human or science or reason and affect into different worlds. They're the people who are um, uh, committing the anthropological uh, sophism, one could call it. And uh, that's why um, all that must be regarded as a myth that will be excluded. So excluded here is um, a transcendental operation. It's not just um, turning one's attention elsewhere and saying um, we're not going to talk about uh, philosophies of difference anymore. It is that, ideally, um, uh, after this book, uh, Larry Wells should talk less and less about um, the philosophies of difference. Unfortunately, this is not the case. He went on to uh, publish um, uh, philosophies of, of difference where he went into uh, detail about his critique of philosophies of difference. Probably that was being conceived, at least conceived, if not written at the same time as this book. So um, maybe it was a necessary stage uh, to go through. And in a certain sense, although he didn't formulate it like that, I think it was a necessary stage in the sense that even today, even in um, contemporary um, uh, English speaking philosophical circles, you see um, going the rounds the idea as if it's obvious that um, Deleuze's philosophy is a philosophy of difference. And uh, Lara Well, on a bad day, which seems to be many days, would agree with them there. But in fact, Deleuze's philosophy has always been, from the beginning, a philosophy of multiplicities. We had multiplicities going in the um, 50s with his discussion of, um, with Deleuze's discussion of Bergson. At a certain moment, he decided to express this philosophy of multiplicities in terms of the, the current categories and that's difference and repetition, which is a thesis. And so had to be, I mean, that's the in institutional I indignity. Uh, it's a very creative thesis, but it's still um, conforming to the academic canons that were reigning at that epoch. And so um, it was uh, a mask, I would say, the philosophy of difference in difference and repetition was the mask, because Deleuze talks about masks and Nietzsche's idea of masks, was um, difference and repetition with his philosophy of difference was the mask that uh, Deleuze had to um, wear at that moment to bring his um, philosophy of uh, multiplicities into the academy. Um, and had gone beyond the philosophy of difference. So after that, it comes back as a refrain in uh, Laruel's later work, but um, it plays a, a lesser role and um, just as well. So um, the Greco unitary myth must be excluded by a theoretically justified science of man. And he puts up three conditions for that. 
This exclusion must be not the cause, but rather the effect of this science of man and of its positive essence. So there he's coming back to the notion of uh, the leap. We have to make uh, the leap into the absolute, into man and the science of man, and then we can push the deconstruction that is operating within uh, the Greco philosophical thought, or, or he calls it a myth now, um, we can push it further. There's a, a, a blockage, a limit to how far the deconstruction can go because it rests a unitary um, method. And even if it's all sorts of different methods, there's still um, this uh, unitary um, Greco ontological um, impulsion uh, behind it. So um, you're not going to get out of it by just going further and further along. There's a limit where um, it can't go. This is the thought of the limit um, that we get in anti-Oedipus. Uh, there are relative limits, but um, what is needed is to, to go to the absolute limit. And the absolute limit is what the science of man can pose as the exclusion of um, the Greco unitary myth. Okay, and this exclusion then is the effect of the science of man and of its positive essence. So the word positive deserves to be um, commented on here because that's another, um, I suppose uh, you could call it, uh, inherent characteristic of the Greco uh, uh, ontological or Greco unitary myth. Sometimes it can be thought of as nihilism and um, all of uh, negativity. So this is why he says that um, in a sense, the essence of the Greco unitary myth, although maybe he wouldn't be willing to concede that uh, such a thing, such a myth has an essence, but the essence of the Greco unitary myth is the auto destruction or auto in inhibition of the mixture of man and logos. So it's the negativity from the beginning, even if negativity takes the mask. This is a different um, direction for the use of masks. Even if um, the Greco unitary myth takes the mask of positivity at the beginning or at certain moments, the driving force behind it is negativity. And at the human level, we can uh, approach this at the um, scientific or at the, philo uh, the new philosophical level or at the transcendental um, level or at um, the human level, because we need more rigor and, and, and more human uh, feeling for um, Lowell. So uh, the theoretical um, critique is that there's this limit. There's no way you can, uh, it's a relative limit relative to that myth. There's no way you can, um, go beyond to the deeper level and that's why you have to make the the leap to um, uh, the absolute to the one the science of man and the human uh, critique is that it's all negative uh, it's all just sort of dissolving things and um, you, you're lost so 
if you've got a good job uh, and you get paid a lot of money, you could afford to um, uh, be lost and uh, the outside circumstances will crystallize you into um, a relative positivity that will be livable. But um, the demand is, and we see this in the work of uh, Mari Ruti, for example, the demand is to have um, an absolute deconstruction, what um, Lowell calls dispersion, that is um, positive, Does it, doesn't just um, pulverize our, our minds and our hearts and our practice and our lives and uh, leave us like um, uh, a little like the clinical schizo, but we need um, a positive essence of man, the transcendental um, man or the ordinary man to um, have from the beginning a positivity, a positive essence that um, is outside and exclusive of the Greco unitary myth. So, positivity, this is one word. I would say one could also characterize it as um, absolute negativity. So, it's a question of um, prioritizing within a conjuncture the proper descriptive terms for this uh, new science of man. Okay. Um, that was the um, second condition. The third condition is that the rigorous, rigorously described phenomenal content of man be at once in an original, be at once, because we're talk, going to talk about two things, and in an original identity, the principal object and the unique subject of this science object and subject being, of course, in quotation marks, because they're um, philosophical jargon words. So this is the thing we said at the, um, at the beginning for the title, uh, Biography of Ordinary Man. Um, we said the of in French, as in English, can be a subjective or an objective genitive. So this is what he's saying here. As an objective genitive, it means that the biography, the scientifically rigorous uh, description of man, that um, this scientifically rigorous description takes man or humans or people as the object. Read as a subjective genitive, that means that humans, man, humans, people, are the very subject of this new science. Not um, abstract, uh, mathematically um, or structuralistically describable um, uh, processes machining processes maybe as well we can put there um, the subject is not even class struggle as ordinary uh, ordinarily understood or well, that, uh, that will be part of it um, the subject is ordinary man and in both cases, as the object and as, as the subject of this science, the science is the rigorously described phenomenal content of man. So we're back to, um, yet again, a reference to experience. This science is not empirical because empirical givens and data experience in that sense is, as we discussed, totally either contaminated, pervaded by or constructed by um, 
ideological or Greco, uh, ontological, anthropological, and so on, uh, prejudices. So he needs another word for the two things, the phenomenal content of um, man and the science of man that he will call experience, or and uh, the empirical for the human sciences and their objects and, and findings um, in the in the world. Um, in a certain sense, these um, terms could be revised or even uh, inverted, but. At other times, um, we'll see Laruel, not in this book, we'll see Laruel accusing philosophy of not being empirical enough. But that's the same accusation. It's not empirical enough because um, its um, experience, its empiricality is factitious. So um, we can retain that uh, this science does have a phenomenal content, is about our experiences, our transcendental experiences, and so is um, responsible to and testable by this phenomenal content, uh, these experiences. In the next paragraph, Laruel says, the human insufficiency of the sciences of man is a theoretical insufficiency. So here um, he's using insufficiency as a synonym for the theoretical carelessness that he's um, described uh, in the forward and, and, and later on. Um, this human insufficiency, that is to say, it doesn't talk about man and it doesn't have a human perspective uh, within it or shaping it, um, is also a theoretical in, in insufficiency. It's not rigorous, although it pretends to be. It's careless. It is just a, a bric-a-brac of anthropological um, prejudices and cheap mathematization. Later on, he will call that sort of attitude as one subsumed under the principle of sufficiency. Here he's um, indirectly, if you want to formulate in terms of um, principles, saying there's a principle of insufficiency um, regimenting uh, the sciences of man and, and philosophy. And both descriptions are, are correct, but um, we're slightly changing the meaning. So, in fact, the principle of sufficiency, which is not alluding to in this text, but we can look at it for a moment, the principle of sufficiency is in fact a principle of insufficiency. Um, philosophy and the human sciences put themselves out as being sufficient. That is to say, um, complete, rigorous, um, testable and passing all the tests, validated all the way through. Um, and there's this other sense of sufficiency that is um, uh, more um, accentuated in French of human sufficiency. And human sufficiency is being um, pretentious, self-satisfied, uh, conceited, narcissistic. That's um, when you say, il est suffisant, 
um, he's uh, sufficient. It's not really in the same sense when you say it in English, but it's that um, notion that uh, he's not really taking a, a human attitude towards things. He's putting himself up on a pedestal and thinking he's great and that um, anyone else is um, inferior. So this form of sufficiency is a human insufficiency. It's not, um, it's not a human attitude. It's not um, uh, woven out of human affects. So that's why he can say, talk about human insufficiency tied to theoretical insufficiency. And these two later will be grouped together under the um, umbrella term sufficiency and the principle of sufficiency. So um, this is why one can see uh, Laruel's whole philosophy as a, um, a virtue epistemology. Human sciences and philosophy are non-virtuous because they're not human and they're not even uh, a virtuous application of, of reason. Even if we forget human relations within themselves, because reason is a criterion for Greco unitary thought, and reason is not even uh, applied rigorously. So um, it's um, intrinsically non virtuous. So he brings that up in the next sentence about the theoretical carelessness of philosophy. And he even says the deficit in uh, the, uh, theor theoria or theoria is not actually specific to these um, weak and inconsistent sciences. It comes first of all from Greek ontological um, prejudices. So this theoretical carelessness is inherent to the tradition. And that means the philosophy is um, undermined as a self undermining um, project from the beginning up to now. It just can't work. And um, so are the human sciences. But he seems to be going a step further and saying that um, the sciences, as they are inserted into this Greek um, Greek unitary thought, the hard sciences have limits because of this theoretical carelessness. Um, embedded in the tradition. So we see that um, today with uh, some people who are discussing the unified field theory and the theory of everything and they're willing to say um, sometimes with um, rather shady arguments based on the role of the observer in quantum theory, they're willing to say that um, maybe the whole of physics to be unified needs to be integrated with a human dimension. But for uh, Laruel, that's just anthropological difference then. The Logos at a certain moment needs to indicate, um, uh, integrate a certain dose of uh, Anthropos to get to where it's trying to go with its final uh, unified uh, theory of everything. But the prediction, because it's a critique, but it's also a prediction. The prediction of Laruel is that's not going to work. That um, there's an inherent, uh, inherent limit to that. So these Greek ontological pre prejudices that structure our thought from the, uh, the beginning two and a half thousand years ago, 
we are obliged to think that because he doesn't really give us uh, dates or, or um, that would be idle discussion for that well. So I think we're getting there as well, an idea that um, by excluding all idle discussion, one, it's not possible. We've remarked on that, that there are figurations and, and dramaturgies going on all through the book. Um, and secondly, not only does it not work, it's, um, it's counterproductive. It creates um, uh, an indeterminacy in um, the positive content of what Larawell is saying. One could argue maybe the um, indetermination is um, minor and that we could always provide the necessary determination ourselves in reading and thinking about the book. But um, there is an indetermination um, that I would say is a lack from uh, the very idea of this pure language that he's building up and of this elimination of quotations um, idle discussion and, and examples. So these holes and gaps within Larawell's discussion are perhaps um, things that trouble some of his readers. But they're, uh, that's a, maybe they put people off. Maybe that's a, a negative uh, effect. Um, a positive effect is that um, they provide an impetus for um, the ongoing theoretical production to um, fill in the gaps or transform his thought via the various waves so that um, these gaps um, will not be present. Another gap we said before was the idea of science, which he fills in later with the idea um, of the quantum. But at this point, um, despite all the methodological precisions for how a transcendental science um, and even uh, an ordinary uh, Greco ontologically dominated science um, can and must pro proceed by um, breaking with the observation language, having a counter inductive leap, um, giving content by uh, um, a filtering down, a trickling down process and, and not a, whatever the opposite of trickling is, uh, not a, uh, an evaporating upwards um, from the observation language. All those things are really um, uh, valid, yet at the same time, Science remains uh, an indeterminate, even though he's giving his science of man, science um, remains uh, indeterminate and he will um, fill in never fully because the idea of determinacy may need to be called into question anyhow, but he will fill in this gap later with his appeal to um, uh, quantum theory. So here he comes back to his um, uh, genealogy and he says that Greek ontological uh, prejudices were only able to produce a counter mythology or a counter sophistry. So uh, for me, this is um, the um, typical genealogy that all um, uh, philosophy students uh, learn in high school because that's, philosophy is um, one of um, the uh, compulsory subjects obviously may rework to made more sophisticated, but um, over and over again, you get this idea that philosophy was born by um, uh, breaking with the mythological worldview and installing um, rational proof as um, the beginnings of 
philosophy and ultimately later of science. So he's taking up that picture and he's changing it nonetheless by saying, yeah, sure, uh, there was mythology before and the so-called break, well, it is a break, but what it produces is a counter mythology or a counter sophistry because part of the myth of the um, beginnings of philosophy is fairly quickly after the break with the mythological worldview the sophists came on the scene because you've got this break between the logos and uh, the world and so they just um, go crazy on the manipulation of, of the logos and uh, teach it uh, to others and there um, he claims that what is retained by the Greco unitary thought is um, philosophy but philosophy as uh, counter sophistry so it's um, a form of sophistry nonetheless so we get that uh, philosophy as counter mythology or counter sophistry instead of uh, phenomenally rigorous and positive science of man so we come back um, to the idea of phenomenally rigorous it has to be true to uh, human experience and positive it's positive in both senses it's um, positive in the sense that it's not uh, a deconstruction and it's positive in the sense that um, it's um, human content including the affects uh, is positive so furthermore in its prudence it established an anthropology which became under the assumed name of science as a man a zone for cutting-edge activities so this raises the question of what is cutting-edge today what we're getting in some ways because we're talking about um, the human sciences and the cutting edge it may be that um, in the current conjuncture we're seeing coming to the fore what was already there the um, medical sciences and the computer sciences so still uh, anthropological difference uh, uh, logos as computation and um, uh, biology and medicine as um, the anthropos side of things this is becoming um, the new uh, cutting edge uh, synthesis where um, at the same time uh, as some observers have said whether with uh, sort of seemingly or perhaps really conservative or, or worse um, uh, theoretical framework as in a gambon or in a sort of um, more progressive um, idea of the same thing we're getting life this is what Deleuze said um, uh, was coming up um, uh, in the, the new paradigm that he saw um, co coming up life um, not just in 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 the sense of um, uh, the bio power um, manipulation and control and so on um, that's part of it but there's just this notion of um, of life and as if there were we're really hardcore we're really cutting edge we're getting something to something really empirical 
and the um, current pandemic um, gives an idea of just how empirical that can be because everybody is experiencing it and um, computer science because that is coming to be more and more not just uh, a descriptive tool as it becomes more and more um, powerful but it's taking on uh, a certain uh, normativity at least uh, via its um, political channeling and we're getting people who say that the solution to the problems of life is um, more informatics, more um, computers. People are um, pure life, reduced, further reduced to um, uh, data points on a network. There, um, that is one of the ultimate or near ultimate developments of Greco unitary thought. So this is what is being thrown up as supposedly uh, the cutting edge of the Western tradition. We know that Laruel thinks that the cutting edge is not there at all, but is in uh, a leap into um, the absolute as man and science of man. So he asks this question. It's a little strange here. There's a little leap because he says, is it still a question of a final philosophical gesture? And the it is not clear because it seems to um, refer back to anthropology, which is in the sentence just before, or there's an it in the sentence um, just before, which seems to refer back to um, philosophy, but maybe we don't have to interpret the it, maybe it's an impersonal it. Um, we're asking, in fact, unless the it refers back to the science of man, we're asking, in fact, are we in the situation of, in the necessity of, a final uh, philosophical gesture? Well, it's a rhetorical question. We know that his answer is no. That's not it. Well, does this radicality no longer belong to the order of philosophy? The rad radicality is his radicality of taking the leap into the science of man. His option, his terminological option, is to say this is no longer um, in the order of philosophy. This is no longer philosophy. I think this terminology cannot be um, of indefinite use over time. There's this um, Althusserian idea um, that he, uh, it's an image he used when he described his um, uh, theoreticist deviation when um, uh, he gave everything to the idea of uh, Marxism as science and he said it was like bending the stick. Well, this is not a stick, but the stick was bent in the humanist direction. So if you let it go, which is not the case here, it doesn't, well, maybe it is, it doesn't bounce back, it stays bent. So to get it to the right position, you have to bend it in the other direction, which is what Althusser claimed he did when he was in his scientific phase. So one could say that uh, Laruel 
is applying the same strategy of uh, bending the stick because um, a man and um, a science of man and not just the human sciences uh, have been um, neglected and it's philosophy that is um, the embodiment of the Greco unitary thought that has to be fought against. He's going to bend the stick in the other direction and say, I'm no longer doing philosophy. My radical gesture, my radicality is not philosophy. He still hasn't got the word non philosophy, but the word non philosophy um, belongs to the same um, bending of the stick. So he needs a word, he calls it science. My uh, uh, radical gesture is not philosophy. Later, um, maybe to get away um, from the um, negativity and uh, a positive, um, a possible um, feeling of indeterminacy when he says, um, my thought is science, not philosophy, because science is indeterminate and it's in these sort of passages um, giving um, somehow uh, superiority to the term that is being negated and so science is being contaminated by this negativity and um, indeterminacy. Maybe that's why um, he goes for non-philosophy and explains that the non is not negative there but uh, an expansion of uh, philosophy into different uses and then later um, he will um, find that maybe that's okay now he's bent the stick enough that he can um, be understood if he um, begins once again to talk in terms of philosophy and he calls it non-standard philosophy and um, forced philosophy. So um, despite his critique of the human sciences as um, being conjunctural, dependent on the conjuncture um, a little earlier on, um, Page three, if you remember at the end of the first paragraph, there's the word context. And I said um, in French, it was conjuncture. So he's um, saying that the only um, necessity of uh, the figures of man in the human sciences comes from uh, the context, the conjuncture. In um, we may sort of using his own theoretical tools to uh, understand um, his, his own position, say, and with the knowledge of later developments, we can say that um, uh, at least some of Larouel's decla declarations are conjunctural in what would Laruel would say is a non-problematic sense. The, um, the new point of view excludes whatever um, comes up, especially uh, what comes up as, as dominant in the Greco unitary uh, thought. So at that time, in that conjuncture, it was necessary to use science as the positive term and philosophy as a negative term. It may be that with the rise of this cutting edge um, uh, biomedical sciences 
and um, computational sciences in a new synthesis that um, Lowell uh, decided later on that scientism in this new synthesis is an even more important uh, adversary and uh, the contemptuous depreciation of philosophy that we see time and time again amongst the physicists and amongst the, um, uh, the computer science informatics crowd and um, in the biomedical uh, fields that this has come to such a point where the conjuncture requires when combined with the requirements of his own thought which are more rigor and more hu humanity it may be that uh, this new conjuncture requires the um, redeployment of the word philosophy with suitable uh, qualifying um, adjectives um, precisely because this um, biomedical calculative uh, reductionism has gained um, uh, a lot more um, amplitude than it had in the um, middle 80s when uh, Lowell produced this book.